Oh my gosh, have I got a case for you. So when the body of a servant girl was found on a lonely dark lane in Dublin, Ireland in the 1700s, the police were stumped. Little did they know that their suspect was a man with no legs who used his cloak of invisibility as a beggar to hide in plain sight. This is the story of Billy in the Bowl. Join me as we travel back to the 18th century in Dublin, Ireland. Oh man, vintage Dublin. Okay, let's paint the picture. It's probably cold, dark, and rainy, like 80% of the year, which is just fabulous because our good friend electricity won't make its way to Dublin for another century. On top of that, there was a huge population boom that led to some very cramped living areas. So you can just imagine the smell and lack of soap that was probably going on there. Because of the huge influx of people living in the city, the architecture began to change for Dublin. A lot of public buildings and lanes that were starting to be built were maze-like and winding, leaving a lot of nice spooky corners for lurkers to hide out in. The buildings and streets were also made out of stone, which is where they derived the name Stony Batter, an area that beggars often occupied. So there was an alarmingly large amount of beggars and homeless people living in Dublin during this time, and they were notoriously known for roaming the lanes and hiding behind corners, relying on scaring rich people into giving them money as their main source of income. One of the scariest among these beggars was a man they famously called Billy in the Bull. His real name was Billy Davis, and he was this local dude who was born without any legs, which was a bit of a challenge. He tried to not let this slow him down, so he began inventing his own way to navigate the uneven, winding streets. But judging by his nickname, I assume you guys have already figured out what that was. Yep, because it was the 18th century and everything sucked, his only means of transportation was by scooting around in this big wooden bowl. And thus, Billy and the Bull was born. So the bull had these two leather straps that would go over Billy's big shredded shoulders that would then secure the bull to his lower half. He also like reinforced the bull with iron so you could hear him coming from a mile away as he was scree screaming over the cobblestones. Since Billy was essentially born into poverty and would never be able to work with his condition, he had to rely on the kindness and generosity of strangers in order to get by. Like I said, the 18th century really must have sucked, especially for other people like Billy. But hey, apparently, Billy had a great face. Billy totally used his Brad Pitt face to his advantage and would go to fairs and public places to beg for money, which would usually earn him quite a bit of stew by the end of the day. The combination of Billy's handsome face and unique physical circumstances always got him pity from a lot of women, and people say Billy really knew how to lay on the charm with the ladies. So he earned his keep begging on the streets from women, and while it was a miserable experience, it at least kept him alive and gave him some attention from people who otherwise would have passed him by. However, begging soon wouldn't be enough to support Billy much longer. Yeah, turns out old Billy Boy had a bit of a drinking problem and he really liked to gamble. I mean, who wouldn't have a drinking problem in the 1700s? Have I reiterated how much it sucked? Indoor plumbing wasn't a thing until the 1840s, guys. That's Judo in the streets while Billy's scooting along in his little bowl with his hands. So of course, a beggar's income wasn't exactly going to support this kind of lifestyle, so he began coming up with clever ways for getting a little bit more out of people. Billy would frequent the areas of Stony Batter and Grange Gorman in Dublin because he particularly loved the large hedges he could hide behind on the dark, secluded streets. So Billy's plan was to wait for the right person to walk by, aka a woman because we are nurturing and caring. Then he would scream out for help and they'd come rushing over. They would feel bad for this tragically handsome guy and he would say he was stuck and ask them to pull him out and that's when he would strike. He'd strangle his victims with his strong, powerful arms until they could no longer hold out, and then grab their valuables and skirt, skirt away. Now I'm going to add in salt, rosemary, and thyme, tomato paste, bay leaves, and garlic. So Billy's first victim was a poor, unsuspecting woman who was walking along the quiet, empty streets in between Grange Gorman and Stony Batter towards Queen Street to visit her friend. Billy unstrapped himself from the bowl, jumped into a bush that was in this ditch, and started doing his moaning and groaning. Obviously, this chick was like, the hell, and went over to investigate. She leaned down towards the dark ditch and two bright green eyes appeared in the darkness. The man said he'd fallen and hurt himself. And then he started begging for help and asking for her to pull him out. She bent down and slowly reached her arms towards the shadowy figure. <sighs> no, don't do it. And that's when a set of humongous, dirty, and calloused hands came bursting through the bushes and straight towards her throat. The hands clasped around the woman's neck and clamped down tight before she could even realize what had happened. But homegirl was not going down without a fight. He yanked her down into the ditch with him and they struggled for a while. But 
Billy eventually tightened his arms around the woman hard enough until she was out cold. After that, he stole her jewelry and purse and took off into the night. An hour later, someone found the woman who was understandably too distressed to give a description of her attacker. But with his first robbery turning out to be a great success, Billy Davis continued to carry out his devious plans again and again, changing locations to different parts of Stony Batter and Grange Gorman to hit up different visitors coming into Dublin from the harbor. And that's when residents of Dublin began to grow nervous. There was a man out there attacking and asphyxiating women for their riches, and it no longer felt safe to walk alone at night. Dublin had quickly turned into a town that dreaded sundown. Of course, no one suspected the man in the bowl, so Billy would continue on with his dastardly doings. And back then, the women didn't have car keys, so they could stick between their fingers or a cell phone that they could pretend they were talking to someone on. So Billy continued earning his income by stealing other people's income, but on one occasion, a sturdy servant girl put up a fight and he ended up snuffing her. The young woman's body was discovered, and now the woman of Dublin had even more reason to panic. This case rocked all of Dublin and became known as the 11 Grange Gorman Lane case. Because the Dublin Metropolitan Police Force had literally just formed, this was actually the very first case that they were faced with solving. And these lads hit the street with vengeance. Billy had to be extra careful now about his little nighttime outings as the guards were patrolling the streets constantly looking for signs of anything suspicious. He also had to desert his usual digs because a bunch of 1700s true crime fanatics would flock to the crime scene to get a glimpse of where the girl had been found for months after the body was actually found. Now I'm going to add in potatoes, beer, and more vegetable broth. Even Billy would comment to passerbys about the crime. He would lament for the girl, stating that she often donated to him. The guards, of course, would pass right over Billy while investigating the case, because who would expect a guy like harmless Billy Davis? But this sudden mobilization of police and early armchair experts caused Billy to stop indulging in his new hobby for a few months. But of course, Billy ran out of funds, and begging just didn't make him feel those special butterflies that harming and robbing people did, so back to his old ways he went. More women continued to get lured into ditches, assaulted, and robbed throughout the area of Dublin, and there were so many complaints that police stepped up their patrols at night. They wanted to catch who everyone was now calling the Stony Batter Strangler. And a lot of people suspected that Billy claimed even more victims during this period of time, but no one could really know for sure, since bodies would turn up all the time with no way to know who'd done it. If only they'd stop to think of the legless beggar dragging himself across the street, away from the scene, hiding in a plain sight. But he finally made his mistake when he tried to attack these two female cooks who were walking past him on Richardson Lane. Obviously, the women were being smart and implementing the buddy system by this point because of the various attacks and bodies showing up after sundown. The story goes like this. One night while Billy was on the prowl, these two sturdy cooks were walking back to the building where they worked. Well, silly Billy didn't realize there were two of them when he jumped in the bush and he did his usual creepy spiel of groaning and moaning for help. The buff chicks were confused and rushed over to the huddled figure in the ditch. Thinking there was only one woman still, Billy popped up and grabbed one of the women in a headlock, trying to drag her into the ditch. She was too strong for him, and the other immediately sprang into action. He grappled with the women, but they shouted for help and made a scene. One of the girls put up a fierce fight with Billy, tearing at his face with her fingernails. The other actually ended up grabbing Billy by his gorgeous black locks and jabbing him in the eye with a hat pin in a sheer moment of badass Irish girl brilliance. So Billy was rolling on the ground in agony with his pin sticking out of his eye and the women were able to get away. They found a patrolman quite easily and the three dashed to the scene. A few other night patrolmen also heard the shouts and ran to the scene and there was Billy and his one-eyed, no-legged glory officially caught red-handed. When they realized the stony batter strangler had turned out to be the legless beggar they hadn't given a passing thought to, they were stunned. A crowd of locals who'd heard the commotion had also gathered around the scene because there was no TV back then, and they grabbed a handcart to quite literally cart Billy the screaming banshee away. They found most of the valuables he picked up right there at the scene, confirming he was the one behind all the recent attacks in the area. Billy was put on trial, and although they suspected that he had taken a few lives, there was not enough evidence to prove it. Instead, he was convicted of robbery with violence. Billy was jailed in Green Street and sentenced to hard labor for the rest of his life while successfully avoiding the hangman's noose. He had to spend the rest of his life using his giant muscular arms to break stones all day. But Billy was kind of like a B-list celeb and he became this quasi-circus act in the prison that made a lot of high society people want to stop by and have a look. 
He eventually passed away in prison and was buried in an unmarked grave in an unmarked location. And although it was never proven that Billy was the one responsible for all the women's bodies that had been turning up in the Stony Batter area, as soon as he was put in prison, the area settled back down to its usual quiet suburban normalcy. But of course, Billy became an absolute legend in Dublin folklore. Supposedly, the ghost of Billy and the Bull still haunts the lonely lanes of Dublin's Stony Batter and Grange Warman areas. Many different stories, pieces of artwork, and drinking songs have been created that feature the famous character from fables and folklore, and the concept of Billy has fascinated and captured the imaginations of people for centuries. Okay everyone, this Irish stew is starting to smell absolutely amazing, so I think it's ready. Now you can serve your stew in any type of bowl, just so long as no one is currently residing in it. 